So I wanted to start my uh, talk with asking a question. What if you could look inside your body to the most minuscule detail? What if you could look at your individual cells? And better yet, what if you could actually look inside those cells and see the inner workings that make up the life of that cell? What if you could actually read your DNA sequence and understand what is that DNA sequence telling you? What is the program that's encoded in that DNA sequence? Well, this is the science of structural biology. It's a visual science where we try to look at the most minute details of life and try to understand how life works and also in disease states, how things are going wrong within those cellular structures. And then in pharmaceutical industry, for example, how can we intercept those diseased cells or tissues to correct the disease state? All this requires visualizing and understanding to the most minute detail of the life that you're studying. So with myself, I got into this field in high school. I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I was very analytical, logical. I wanted to understand things, understand the natural world. But I couldn't decide between biology and chemistry. So I progressed in my studies and in undergraduate studies, I discovered biochemistry, which is combining those two fields. But it was also very fundamental science. It's the fundamental science behind molecular biology, immunology, botany, everything that we've heard today from other biologists, where life can be reduced to chemical reactions and interactions between different um, components within cells. So one life-changing moment for me was when, um, I, in my second year of undergraduate studies, a professor took me on and a small group of other undergrads who really didn't know what we were doing, we were just beginning our careers, but trusted us with and uh, giving us research questions to, uh, to address and to do our own independent research and come back once a week and discuss as a group. And to me, it was really groundbreaking for me because I looked at professors with awe. These people were experts in their field. They've been doing this for decades. And here I was a lowly un undergrad. And these prof this professor was trusting us with helping him with his research. So that was one life-changing moment. A second life-changing kind of series of moments was I've always been interested in the history and development of science the philosophy and how scientists should think and how science, the scientific method operates. So one of my favorite authors growing up was reading Carl Sagan. So he's an astronomer. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. And he is an amazing science communicator. So if you're interested in science communication, look him up. He had a, a documentary series on astronomy in the 1970s that was beautiful. And now it's actually been recapitulated and reinvented by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it's been awesome as well. So just what Carl Sagan communicated in his words and his program was just how crazy beautiful the world is, the universe is. So some of us manifest that in astronomy. We try to understand how the, astro how the, the universe works. But to him, it was almost a spiritual journey where it's almost a religious experience just to understand how crazy complicated the world is. So for me, I applied this to understanding the minute details of life in biochemistry. So structural biology teaches us that biology is arranged around this axiom that form equals function or determines function. So what I mean by that is that the arrangement in three dimensions of an organ, a tissue, um, an animal, or even down to the most minute structure of life, DNA. The arrangement in space determines what that thing can do. So if we, we, you might be familiar with the structure of DNA as a double helix. Well, it's that way because that structure provides it with two functions. It can copy itself. It has two strands. They can separate and then become copy themselves. And also it encodes information to create proteins. And this is where people don't really maybe if you're not familiar with biological sciences, proteins are this black box, but proteins are the workhorses of life. And this is really where this concept of form equals function plays a really, really important role. So that's actually what I'm showing here is a variety of protein structures, three-dimensional structures that have been determined by scientists over decades. And to me, these are amazing. You're looking at the most fundamental details that create life, that create chemist that, that cut, catalyze chemical reactions, that create particles that infect other cells. And every time I see these, it's just, a, it's, it's an amazing experience. And I've looked at hundreds of these over my career, but every time I discover a new protein structure, it's another amazing um, experience. So for example, this is a virus. This is actually only about one or two or three proteins that form this, this outer structure of the virus. So this blue, um, colored is, uh, is almost like a soccer ball. They're individual proteins that touch themselves and form this, like a soccer ball, structure that forms the outside of the virus and the DNA of the virus is inside. 
Um, another cool structure is this. This is called a chaperone, and this is a series of proteins that forms a cage, sort of like a virus, but this is with a different purpose, where proteins inside can assemble themselves as they need to. So it's a chaperone, meaning it helps other proteins adopt the three-dimensional structure they need to do their work. Um, another protein I wanted to show you is over here. This is called myosin. This is a very important protein found in muscle cells. This, this protein can expand and contract and utilize energy to do so. And as we know, this is what muscles are supposed to do. So muscle cells are able to expand and contract, and this is due to the function of the myosin protein. So in my work, I'm interested in discovering new protein structures. So specifically, I have various research interests, but um, today I basically have, this, for the sake of time, tell you about one of my main research interests is antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic re resistance. So this is the superbug phenomenon where bacteria are able to uh, cause infection in humans and they're very, very difficult and increasingly impossible to treat with antibiotics. So what are antibiotics? These are basically wonder drugs that were discovered in the early 20th century, starting with penicillin, where previously infections caused by bacteria that would kill you and have killed millions of people over, the, over civilization, cholera, the plague, diarrhea, um, even sexually transmitted diseases caused by bacteria, could be cured by these miracle drugs called antibiotics. So of course, as humans often do, we became irresponsible with them throughout the 20th and now the 21st century, we use antibiotics when we shouldn't be using them. We use, overuse them in medicine. Probably many of you have gone to a doctor and been diagnosed with some, just a flu, a cold. Chances are it's caused by a virus. Antibiotics don't work on viruses, but maybe the doctor prescribed you a course of antibiotics. So what those antibiotics do is create this huge pressure on the bacteria in your system to fight back. And this is actually where bacteria are winning this battle. So bacteria are amazing at adapting and they've seen, as we, as we heard with George's talk, they can exist in a crazy environments, like at the, the surface of volcanoes. So bacteria have seen all these stresses throughout the eons that they've been around. And they've actually seen antibiotics before as well. So this huge stress, so in medicine we overuse antibiotics, and in agriculture as well. We add an ag antibiotics to uh, in farm feed to make chickens grow fatter, pigs grow fatter, but they're not sick. We just add them because the industry thinks or they've been conditioned to think that this in enhances the production of the, of the animal. So this has created this huge pressure on bacteria to fight back, and of course they do. And what do they do? They evolve these proteins, molecular machines, we also call them. They, we, they've evolved proteins that are able to sense those antibiotics and destroy them. They've evolved proteins that are able to enhance the structure of the bacteria to make them more impenetrable to the antibiotic. Or they've evolved other proteins that find the antibiotic that's inside the center of the bacteria and spit it out. So in my work, I'm trying to understand how is it that these bacteria are able to evolve these molecular machines, these proteins are able to resist antibiotics. So then using structural biology techniques, I've been able to discover brand new ways that bacteria are able to do this. And then we are, we've been working with pharmaceutical companies that then take our information from these techniques to then improve the, that chemical structure of the antibiotic so maybe the bacteria can't identify it and destroy it anymore. So this is a really important field, and uh, it, it's, we're fighting back against the bacteria, but it's an endless, it's gonna be an arms race that will continue for decades. And we hope to not return to that time where we didn't have antibiotics, and we had these plagues and real, really serious outbreaks. So hopefully we won't get back to that time. So that's a little bit of what I do, and um, I hope I've given you a sense of what structure biology is and how it's a fundamental science that really drills down to the inner workings of life itself. And I hope I've given you a little bit of a sense of what inspired me to get into this field, but I want to leave you with one message. And I think we've learned a lot about different science today, and I think the unifying principle behind how we've been able to have these careers and learn things about the world is the method of science itself. And it really is the best method we have as a civilization to address serious problems that are facing us. Climate change, overpopulation, um, sustainability issues, resource utilization. That template of being critical, analytical, developing a theory, testing the theory, and maybe throwing it out if your observations don't uh, accord to that theory, 
and iterating that and progressively finding more and more information. And we can actually apply that to all walks of life. So whether you're uh, in law, whether you're in history, whether you're in philosophy, whether you're in arts, that template of being critical, developing a theory, testing it, and maybe changing your theory to come up with a better one, I think serves us well as a civilization. So, thanks. What is your favorite or the most interesting superbug you've worked on? So there's, it, it gets pretty scary. So there's some bacteria that, there's a bacteria called Acinita bomanii, and it's found in the Middle East. So a lot of uh, war veterans that have come out of Iraq war, for example, U.S. soldiers, have gotten sick with this bacteria, and it's resistant to basically every antibiotic we have. There's about 20 or 25 different classes of antibiotics, and this bacteria just can, can resist all of them. So we're trying to understand what makes this bacteria able to do that, what are those molecular machines, these proteins that are able to do that, and um, we're trying to improve the antibiotics we have. That might give, you, might give us an extra window of time in which we can treat these, these serious infections. But people are dying from these bugs, right? And it's increasingly a more important problem. So these bacteria are presumably evolving their resistance blindly through natural selection. Is there a way to have the proteins undergo natural selection to just blindly evolve ways to kill the bacteria? Well, it's not the proteins that are killing bacteria, right? It's the, it's the chemicals themselves. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, I'm sure, I hope pharmaceutical industry is doing that where you can actually, um, so actually that's routine now is that when a new antibiotic is being discovered or developed, they immediately look for resistance because you know it's going to happen. And then you sequence the genome of that bacteria and you discover what is the protein that confers that resistance, and then you feed that back into your chemical synthesis that makes the antibiotic. So it's, it's almost like now it's considered that antibiotic resistance is inevitable, and because of this natural selection, and that's being fed into the drug development pipeline. The only problem is it's expensive and takes a lot of time to develop any of these drugs. And unfortunately, a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't do it anymore because they can't make money off it. Um, so that's why academic scientists are, are doing this. So we're trying to take that evolutionary approach where we know resistance is going to happen and we incorporate that as much as we can into the, chemi the chemistry of the antibiotics themselves. So you're mentioning an arms race and, and how the bacteria are getting better and then we get better antibiotics and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in, in biology, we, we know that the best relationships between multiple species are symbiotic ones, win-win situations, right? So you, you develop in concert and you both give each other a hand and then everything's hunky-dory. So is there much research into these multi-community approaches to bacteria that, you know, instead of treating with antibiotics, let's treat with other biotics? that can then create more of a balance. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a huge area of research where I think the industry and scientists in academia as well are realizing, you know what, maybe antibiotics are not the way to go. Even if we do invent a new antibiotic within years, it will go obsolete, so to speak. So yeah, there are, there's a lot of research going into understanding the community. So basically when we take an antibiotic, it's going to be destroying the communities of bacteria that are naturally within us, right? And it's putting things out of equilibrium. So yes, absolutely. People are looking at what are the species that need to exist that would keep the pathogenic species in check. Um, so it's not my field of research, but definitely it is. So we were talking before um, before this uh, the talk started actually that um, C. diff is a bacteria that um, people get infected with that in, in hospitals. And a cure, it's a little bit gross, but a cure is replenishing the natural microbiome in your stomach, which is basically other bacterial species from poop. So people are developing ways to maybe make this more amenable as a drug, because you don't want to be eating poop. But basically poop is a collection of bacteria, a community of bacteria, so to speak, that has come out of you, right? So we know that cures this. We know that cures C. diff infections better than any antibiotic. So people are researching new ways to harness the beneficial bacteria from poop or maybe some other way and then putting it back into your system. And then those beneficial bacteria will take care of the pathogenic, the bad ones. So yes, absolutely, that is burgeoning research for sure. I'm so glad somebody brought it back to the whole saliva 
spit thing <laughs> because we have to remember that you are what you eat minus what you excrete. And we're actually losing our microbiomes. And this is actually a huge issue that we don't have that diversity. Um, and there's amazing, I'm sure you know about it, new research um, showing that because our microbiomes change, we're actually, um, our whole interaction with food and nutrition and our immune systems is a super, I just read this amazing oh, yeah, article yeah. in The Atlantic. Anyway, you probably saw it. No, I, it's, it's not my field. I'm not into microbiomes, but it's crazy. Like people think that a lot of diseases, Alzheimer's disease, even psychiatric diseases have to do with what bacteria are existing in our gut, intestine, stomach, etc. It's not my field, but it's pretty crazy stuff where there's this gut brain axis and we don't fully understand it yet. Thank you so much, Peter. Um,